Can you handle the truth? Welcome to Activist. I'm Gareth. And I'm Jackie. Seb Alex is one of the vegan movement's best loved animal rights advocates and speakers. In today's episode, we speak about a whole range of topics, including using facts to back up your advocacy, dining with non vegans, and how a trip home to see family in Lebanon took off his animal advocacy in a whole new direction. If you enjoy this content, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, smash that like button, and drop a comment if you've learned something from this. We thoroughly enjoyed this interview and we hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. for joining us today Seb I have to say that when we first went vegan four years ago you were one of the very first activists that we came across and we immediately loved how your act advocacy rather should I say and activism but advocacy is so fact-driven um, working against a, a narrative that's all too commonly anecdotally defended how important is it that we don't just take what we see and hear at face value and actually dig deeper when researching our topics yeah, so uh, that's a really good question because even when I, I started doing activism, when I first went vegan, um, I was uh, really all over the place. You know, I, I would see like a meme and I would just post it on my Facebook and someone would go like, have you checked if this is true? And then I would check it, like the facts behind that would turn out to be wrong. So with time, I just realized we have such a strong cause. We have such a strong argument for animal rights that we have to make sure we don't use... Um, misinformation uh, in, in our advocacy. Because the second you do that, you will lose, um, like what you're saying might lose value. For example, I've had this uh, discussion with a friend of mine. Um, there was a photo taken of a cow in a truck and there were tears going down the eye of the cow. And uh, that friend posted it on Facebook saying, this cow is crying on the way to the slaughterhouse. And my other friend grew up on a farm and she was like, um, just to let you know, cows don't cry in that way. You know, they're not, I mean, we shouldn't think that they're like us. That happens when it's too dry because they're in the truck and there's wind, you know? And, and there's this argument that started, and it made me realize because I thought the same thing, that they're crying because they're sad or they're upset or they're lonely. But that's because that's how crying is perceived to us. That's how we would cry. And these are things that we do, obviously, with good intentions, but that someone who knows that cow, that, that, that cow wasn't crying because she's sad or she's lonely would go like, oh, this vegan is just trying to use like emotional pictures to make us go vegan. And I think we really have to be careful to make sure everything we are saying is fact-based, double-check all the sources. You know, Just because it comes from a vegan website, for example, doesn't mean that it's the ultimate truth. Always check the studies we're sharing and always make sure that um, what we're saying is strong enough for no one to counterattack. Hi, that, that's some brilliant yeah, advice. Because so um, it's nothing worse than than someone who isn't vegan catching you out when you think that you're yeah. on point. <laughs> yeah, but um, your YouTube channel is oh, it's fantastic. Um, which we'll be linking to in the bio of this um, video. But it's got full. It's just so full of binge worthy content. Yes, I just had a full on day of it, and you just it's so full of um great knowledge the learning opportunities are just fantastic and i really uh, encourage all our viewers to go over there and check it out um but in a recent video you spoke about a fantastic tool um to assist activists called faunalytics uh with the catchphrase animals need you you need data um can you briefly tell our audience about this tool and its implementation in our advocacy yeah, so I've been using this website for a bit over than, than a year now. It's called Faunalytics. That's F-A-U-N-A-L-Y-T-I-C-S. Um, so it's an organization that works on gathering data that could be helpful of, for animal rights advocates and any animal rights advocate. I'm not talking about those who are doing street activism or doing rescues or only social media. I'm talking about people who run restaurants, things like that. So they really sit down and they gather all the studies, they do their own studies, um, just to make it easier for activists to know what works better. So for example, they can gather data over what makes people go vegan the most, what is the number one reason, what makes people fall out of veganism, uh, for how long does someone need support once they go vegan? You know, I think it's about the first three months you have to check in on them and make sure they're understanding the ethics of veganism and animal rights. So they bring in all this amazing data and it's categorized in different subjects. 
Um, for example, for restaurant owners, they have studies that show what, um, which names for your uh, vegan options would make a non-vegan choose your vegan option. Things like this. It's really interesting. Um, so I use it uh, because I do lectures in universities and schools, and I would like to know the facts. You know, like it's it's nothing. Studies and statistics are the best thing that exists because it helps you check if what you're doing is is uh, done in the most impactful way. So uh, I do want to tell all activists and even non-activists who are interested in seeing the numbers and the statistics about veganism and animal rights, do check out the website. It's a free tool. They, they're just there to help you out and everyone should take advantage of that. It's absolutely wonderful. And we'll be sure to link that as well in the bio of this video. I need to go check it out. I, d I hadn't heard of it before now. And then just this morning, I opened up my uh, my LinkedIn and it came up that Fornalytics were looking for, for new stuff. It was like, what? Yes. Okay, all of a sudden, this is telling me something, you know, I need to go and check this out now. So um, yeah, it sounds brilliant. And throughout the series, you know, we've had speakers bring up the point that veganism isn't a diet. It's a philosophical, philosoph I can't. I'm having the stumbles today. <laughs> Philosophical belief. Uh, we were actually talking to uh, Jordi Kesamajana recently, and, and that was uh, fantastic. That was something that we, we talked about a lot with his book. But according to Fornalytics data, which I've got to check out now myself, 58% of you, um, people have said they were motivated by health when becoming vegetarian or vegan. And in another of your videos, you make the point that this is the reason why, you know, we have a string of people abandoning the diet yeah. when, you know, when these, <laughs> when these influencers decide to brand themselves as ex-vegans, you know, should we even yeah. care about that? Were they even actually vegan in the first place? So I've, I've made a video about that because there was one, uh, let's say, influencer uh, who went on like back and like he was vegan and then he tried eggs and then he was vegan again and then he became carnivore and now he's vegan you know and i made a video like does it even matter and th my answer is that it does matter because so uh, for my youtube channel i have an extension called um, tube buddy and it just brings you to st statistics and things like that to help you grow your channel um and they send me emails every week of what's trending under the keyword vegan and Usually when one of those influencers stop being vegan, the trending video on all of YouTube about veganism is their video. So I believe it does matter and all activists should immediately make counter videos to that so that for every view that their video gets, our videos rank next to it as other videos you can watch related to this video. So then we can debunk their stances, we can bring in the animal rights subject that they don't talk about because they only talk about their health so we can raise awareness about the animal wrestling so we can use their video going viral for our benefit to bring in the subject of animal rights um of course a lot of them just like they do it as a diet as you said because i mean if you just google the word vegan online you just see fruits and veggies and things like that there's nothing about ethics nothing about animal rights and i think it's our responsibility as animal rights activists who are vegan for animal rights to raise awareness as much as we can, especially on social media. Yeah. That's a great idea. I love that aspect of it. Mm. Yeah, counteracting. Like uh, while watching that video, it prompted me to wonder about um, if we perhaps need to start referencing the diet that many of us are following as purely, you know, plant-based or whole food plant-based and instead refer to our veganism as our philosophical beliefs, you know, um, making that separation between the two. and. Um, yeah, like we're, we're guilty of it. We've done a cookbook, which was um, everyday vegan and is a yeah. vegan cookbook. But now we wonder whether plant based would have been better because it is a plant based diet. Isn't that um, it wasn't necessarily our philosophy on the pages. Um, yeah, maybe we should have done a plant based cookbook for ethical vegans as a subtitle or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be very interesting. But um, what are your thoughts on the use of using this language, you know, um, and separating that sort of diet and philosophy? So I agree. Um, I think, you know, when you say vegan, it should not immediately mean plant-based. It should, it should, people should immediately think of the animals, not the food that you're eating. But unfortunately, that's what, where we are right now. And that's why I've even stopped um, identifying with the expression vegan activist. I'd much rather say animal rights activist because I'm not an activist who have more vegan options in restaurants. I'm not an activist 
for the right to be vegan. I'm an activist for animal rights. Um, and I think it's nice to have the conversation immediately brought on the other animals. So if you're sitting on a table and someone says, would you like some of this? And you know, that's not vegan. You say, no, I don't want to have any of that. And they say, why? And you say, I'm, because I'm vegan. The conversation might end there, or maybe they start a conversation about why you're vegan. But if you say no, because I'm an animal rights, I'm pro animal rights, and I believe this, what you're offering me violates animal rights, then they have no other option than to think about other animals and what we're doing to them. And I think um, I'm not the kind of person who would say everyone should stop using the word vegan. I'm, that's, I'm, it's fully personal. And um, I, I just found more value in my own experience to refer to what I do in that way. I think that's a fantastic point. Um... And for us here at Vegan FTA, we're constantly sharing about all the different forms of activism people can be taking up. Yeah. And it makes me think about um, even your hospitality activist coming into the conversation saying that you're a hospitality activist then begs the question as to what that is. And yeah, it's, it's brilliant. As you say, it's, it really helps us start that topic going in the right direction that you want it to. Absolutely. So on the topic of dining, which leads in quite nicely, you've also spoken in the past about the scenario of sharing a table with Carnis. And I love the example that you've given about how we would never sit with someone who was eating a dog. Um, even thinking back to our own Carnis days, you know, I would have found that absolutely abhorrent and not wanted to be subjected to that at all. And you describe the commitment to not sharing the dining experience with Carnis as a logical extension of our animal, animal rights advocacy is it friday it's friday here in new zealand that's my problem <laughs> would you mind sharing your thoughts on this matter with our audience <laughs> sure so uh, this is very similar to what i shared before completely personal thing and i don't shame in any way for someone who would not is not willing to do this um, because different people have different uh, situations they're in different contexts different relations with their families and friends uh, so personally, uh, the first time I decided that I do not want to share a table with uh, any non-plant-based food on it uh, was when I was visiting my family in Lebanon and I was eating like no one, none of my family members are against veganism, uh, but they weren't vegan and I was eating my vegan meal and everyone else was eating either some vegan meal, but also animal products. And I was just looking around and I thought, I don't feel comfortable sitting with you, my own family, and watch you undo everything I'm trying to do in my life. It just really hurts. Like, I almost really disrespectful. You know, I'm trying to make a change in this world, and then I'm sitting with you and watch you cancel that change by eating more animals. So I spoke with my family, and I said, from now on, um, if it's not fully vegan, I don't want to sit on the table. Uh, you're free to do that. I will just eat by myself and then I can join you when you're done. And in the beginning, it was met with some resistance, but eventually they were like, yeah, whatever. I mean, everyone loves vegan food anyway. It's not like they're going to not eat the vegan food. So we did that very, very few times. Um, there was uh, not vegan food and I just didn't sit on the table. And whenever I do that, they it's always like a, slap in the face for them, like a reminder, like, yeah, this is not nice. He's just sitting there by himself. We might as well just eat vegan. Um, but then with time, both of my parents uh, became vegan as well. So it's much easier now. Uh, and after a year of doing that with my family, I extended this to people that I meet or spend time with in any way, uh, simply because I think there are a few reasons. One of them is because I just don't respect their decision to eat animals. I don't respect their decision to violate animal rights. And they're, while I'm sitting with them on the table, they're actually in that moment doing the process that I'm against. So my question is like, would I sit on a table while someone is being actively racist? I wouldn't. Or if I did, I would call them out or stop them. And if, and if I knew in advance they're going to be actively racist towards someone, let's say in a restaurant, I would say I'm not going to sit with you because I don't appreciate your attitude uh, and your discrimination, of course. So I wanted to extend that to everyone I meet. And another th reason is that people think that if you sit with them, you have your vegan meal, they have their non-vegan meal, they can try yours and realize it's really tasty, and you can talk to them about veganism. Well, there has been studies that show that people are more likely to agree with veganism and consider animals as um, important for our moral um, decisions 
if they are not at the same time eating animals. So basically what they did is they had two groups in a study um, with the same survey about um, how much we should consider animals, morally speaking, and their sentience. Um, one group was snacking on non-vegan food, the other group was snacking on vegan food, and the group snacking on vegan food was, gave more consideration to animals while filling out the survey than the group that was eating um, animal parts. So obviously, the, it means if I sit down with someone and I tell them that I would like them to eat vegan because I don't feel comfortable um, accepting their behavior, I mean, obviously you, you say it in a very nice way, very friendly way, you don't pressure them or shame them, then I have much higher chance to get my point across about veganism than if they're, gonna, if, than if they're eating animal uh, body parts. Um, ever since I've started doing this, I have not had a single situation where the person said, well, I don't wanna eat with you then. Yeah, it just never happened because if someone is not even gonna consider eating one vegan meal with you because of your ethics, it's, it doesn't look that nice on them. Um, I've even been um, with um, two friends of mine. One of them is a hunter and I first explained it to her and she gave me like this face. And then for three days that we were spending uh, together, the three of us, every single time we were gonna eat, she would take out her phone and say, all right, where do you wanna eat? What vegan restaurants are in this area? Uh, she was very respectful and then she was one of the first people that joined me when I went into a slaughterhouse um, to film slaughter and when I went back home um, she went to her place I went back home she messaged me she said I can't understand how you can even sit on a table with me so she said I can't even imagine you would sit on a table where I'm even eating vegan food uh, so she people can see that it goes against your ethics um so I really encourage people to try it, but I don't want to say some people are not in the space. They don't have the safe space to give this a try. Some people live with their families and their families are, let's say, very, um, maybe they they bully them or they shame them for their veganism. You're not a bad person if you don't do this. I have the privilege of doing this. It doesn't mean everyone has that privilege as well. So I do want to respect people who can't do this in their lives. Yeah, well, that's, that's a fantastic way of, of looking at it, isn't it? Thank you so much for that advice. I know it's something that we struggled with for a long time. It was just the two of us and we had no problem But when we were traveling, but then lockdown happened and now yeah. we're kind of integrated back into normal life as it was in normal situations. And um, it does come up, doesn't it? And, and I think the longer you're vegan, the, the worse it gets at the start. Yeah. You know, I was a little bit sort of like, oh, you know, if you want to eat your burger, I'll sit with you or whatever. But now I can't look at, what yeah. someone is eating without seeing that as a who and i just i just can't do it so um yeah there's a lot of some uh, some great advice out there really appreciate that and um you know it's, there's lots of good stuff happening in the vegan world in november 2020 many vegans celebrated the announcement from oxford university regarding their upcoming beef and lamb ban well at first glance indeed this is cause for celebration but um, while this is good news for cattle and sheep, at least, you raise the point that this move could actually result in even more abuse and death for chickens who are horrendously exploited as it is. So, you know, it's a great example of how we shouldn't take things at face value and that we should actually be celebrating cases of real reduction and total abolition of animal exploitation. So when checking out these media stories, is there a thought process that you use to define the victories and losses? Yeah. So uh, it's funny because I'm pretty sure I have shared something similar a bit more than a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, as a victory. Like, yes, they banned it. I think it was in a Portuguese university. And then this year, you know, and, and this is what I mean. A, a lot of people have this um, attitude on social media where they don't want to admit if they're wrong or something. I'm usually the complete opposite. I want to advocate for people to see that it's good to realize that you're wrong because then you, you can be better. Um, and I'm also never embarrassed to admit that I'm wrong I'm, because I consider myself just a human being who can make mistakes and, and have wrong reasoning and things like that. Um, so I have celebrated this. But this year, the way I looked at it is I always check if a certain um, decision or event that seems as a victory is um, reflecting a less suffering or going into the direction of less suffering. And with the case of the Oxford University uh, voting on banning on um, beef and lamb, uh, if it's not, if th they did this for environmental reasons, 
but it is not in any way, to my knowledge, I didn't find anything related to animal rights. Like it is not in any way accompanied by animal rights, to my knowledge. Um, no animal rights awareness or content has been shared along their decision of banning um, uh, beef and lamb, which means that people are not gonna uh, not eat meat because they care about the animals. They're gonna do it for the environment. So if you don't have any ethical point there about animal rights, they can just eat chicken. And chickens are smaller, which means if the same amount of people that were eating meat or lamb switch the chicken, more animal lives are going to be lost as a result. And I do in one way think it's a good thing that they are open to banning certain animal products. Um, I like that the, the willingness to ban is there. But I do wish that um, animal rights activists or vegans within the university raise the question of some kind of animal rights awareness along the ban so that people maybe switch to maybe, I mean, maybe when they take out the beef and lamb, they introduce vegan options. I didn't find any information on that, unfortunately. Maybe that's what they're going to do. But if they didn't say that's what they're going to do, I can't claim that is. Um, so if that was the case, if they introduced vegan options instead, I think it's a victory because it's replacing a previous item on the menu. Um, but as long as we don't have any proof of that, I don't think we should celebrate it. Yeah, when I'm doing the research for this uh, talk, I was trying to get into the Oxford Unif um, University website to try and find out if the menu had been updated online or anything, but unfortunately, you, it seems you have to be a student there. So if any students are out here in the audience, um, drop a line in the comments, you know, if you know any more on this topic, because it'd be, it'll be great to know if we can really support this and win with it or yes. if we've lost with it. But you know, either way, it's, it's more of a, a sidestep than a backstep, if anything, I feel. Yeah. Um, but we touched on the topic uh, just then about the importance of um, us needing to share and accept both the good and the bad news um, in the vegan movement. Uh, do you feel it's important that we have this transparency um, so as not to be like the animal agriculture industry that is constantly trying to cover itself up? Yeah, definitely. So I that was one of the things that I was doing a bit more than a year ago, where I would share vegan news every week on my uh, YouTube channel, but I would share the good and the bad. And a lot of people didn't like it because I was mentioning the good. And it always upset me that people were not interested in the bad news because the bad news can actually show us where we have to put uh, more work. And I've been thinking about making a video recently about uh, the opening, well, the reaction of the vegan community about the opening of the so-called vegan, uh, biggest vegan burger factory in the UK or Europe, if I'm not mistaken. During the same week, China um, shared the news of the building of the biggest pig farm in the world. It is massive. I mean, there, I don't know how many millions are gonna be bred into existence every single year. It's just a huge plane with, I don't know, eight or 10 buildings just next to each other. And then they're all farms. And no one was talking about that. People were only talking about the opening of the biggest vegan burger factory, but no one talking about the bad news of the opening of the biggest pig farm in the world. And I know that we are very limited as like, what can we do? Like, I don't know what I can do to stop China from doing something like that. But just because I don't know what I can do doesn't mean that I shouldn't talk about it because maybe someone is going to have an idea if I talk about it. So I do think we should pay attention to the bad news much more than the good news because the more bad news we work on, the more good news we get in return. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you're so right. It's, it's the same, you know, I go through Facebook every day, social media and for the news and for every yay story, there's a, oh my God, are you serious yeah. story, you know, and it, it can definitely get you down. But it's so important that we know about this stuff, because if we don't, we can't fight it and people just keep getting away with it. But um, on a couple of occasions recently, I've had people say to me that there's no place for veganism in politics and how the two shouldn't mix. 
And to me, if it wasn't for the political realm, though, things such as the animal agriculture industry would have collapsed long ago. I mean, especially here in New Zealand, it's, you know, in so many countries, there's only government subsidies which are even propping them up and enabling them to continue with the mass exploitation. Yeah. So um, I myself have um, entered into the world of, of politics a couple of times over the past three months um, through my activism, which has been a blast. And I've found it to be really important and impactful, you know, the, what we're can say can really impact politicians that are not aware of what's going on um how about you do you feel that veganism does have a place in politics and if so you know how is that so i definitely do think and one person that inspires me a lot i i would never be able to do that i'm just not a politics type of person um but i know emma hurst from uh, australia an amazing animal rights advocate she's a politician um andy maddox well from australia and it, to be able to enter politics and have the strong message of animal rights, I think is really important. And more importantly, as you uh, mentioned, the subsidies uh, and subsidies are not something we can fight in the street, except if we're doing, let's say, petitions and things like that. But I do believe that we need some kind of lobbying power. Now, the problem there that I have not figured out yet is that our lobbying power is not if I want to be realistic, in my opinion, never going to be as strong as lobbying power of the animal agriculture industry because they are, I don't know how many hundreds of billions of dollars worth of an industry. The, the, the purchasing power that they have as lobbyists, the amount of money that they can spend in lobbying is always going to be so much more than what vegans could spend. Even if we all got together and, and gave all our savings, this, these are food companies and people eat food every single day and mostly non-vegan food. So they're profiting every single day and making billions, billions, billions. And then they invest a lot of those billions in lobbying. So I don't want to sound depressing. I know it's sad to hear this, but again, it's the truth and it's bad news. And yeah, we should all think about it collectively and see if we can find a solution. Yeah, we need as many as we can to get into the sector. So once again, you know, we have those minds working on solutions, because um, if we're not working on the problem, if we're not looking at the bad news, you know, we're not, um, yeah, we're not getting yeah. to that point. Um, and we need more Emma Hurst. She was the one that got me into politics, actually. Yeah, I was helping her out last year, which was, uh, which was great. She's awesome. We need more Emmas. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the political sector, we've seen campaigns and petitions from the animal agriculture industry to ban the use of names in terms of vegan products, um, which relate to the, the industry's own labeling. Um, in a previous episode of the series, we spoke to Jordi Casmajana briefly about this topic and his belief, um, although it's great for new vegans to have these, um, these products and all the plant they see to have these sort of products which are named the same um, and act the same, um, he made the point for the importance of us creating our own terms uh, for these, for our own products based on these things. Yeah. Um, so as to leave behind the, the demand for the concepts of things like steaks, you know, because if we keep saying that we need steak, um, it doesn't matter if it's a mushroom or a, a meat steak, they still have that, that edge in there. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I actually do believe the same way. I've wondered about this for a long time. It, it's funny that the animal agriculture industry doesn't want us to use the words because they, they believe it's disingenuous, but then they call flesh meat, they call um, chicken ovulation eggs, they call um, cow breast milk, milk. They always use like a different term um, because obviously if they call it what it is, people are gonna have to think twice about it before buying. Um, but I, I, I wondered, like, when, when I say I want a burger, I want a vegan chicken burger, I don't feel very comfortable. I don't feel comfortable putting the word chicken or fish in the same sentence as a burger that I'm going to eat. I don't feel fully comfortable with that. So I have wondered about it. My only question is, in what way, in what words are we going to use to make the non-vegans consider buying it? Because the reason they buy it is because they're going to see that it's an alternative. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult one. And I think over time, um, once again, some brilliant mind out there might might crack a wonderful term for it. Um, I want to see more Gary. Did you did you hear about that, Seb? You know, in Sainsbury's when someone was complaining in, in the UK, I, it was a while ago now, you know, no, you can't call it cheese. Yeah, so I'm 
perfectly happy with that. You know, as long as Gary's out there, don't mind. I'm, I'm happy to go with Gary for vegan cheese for starters. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same. Like, if and what a coincidence as well that that woman just made that random video and everyone started picking up picking up on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly i don't know about uh, about you over there but um i know over here we have a lot of references to karen's at the moment you know don't be a karen all the poor ladies out there called karen maybe we can find a product that's that's nice yes. <laughs> no, a vegan product that we can call karen and you know lift, lift them up again lift yeah. up the karens <laughs> And uh, one thing many activists experience is burnout, um, often from, you know, advocating and giving their all for the animals, but not giving themselves the support that they need to sustain that fight. And um, we personally, both of us have, have dealt with burnout and we know that you have too in the past. Um, some vegans, however, may not well even realize that they have become burnt out as a result of their commitment to advocacy. You know, I didn't realize when um, when I was sort of getting checked out that I wasn't on the road to it. I was already there, you know, and I'm sure yeah. I'm not alone in that. So um, could you tell us a little about your own experience and what it was like to reach that point? Yeah, so um, I remember my burnout was... Um unfortunately and, and another thing this is almost embarrassing if there's non-vegans listening but my burnout um, cause was not even the advocacy itself but it was other vegans who um, I believe like lack skills of communication and open communication and the willingness to grow as a movement and I find it very difficult until today um, and I'm not the only one I've heard this from several a lot of activists not several um, so before talking about my experience, I do want to say that if you're a vegan activist, please, please, please consider being um, uh, compassionate towards other activists and, and try to make sure that when you see something you don't agree with, you have good intentions to change the other person's stance and you do that the right way instead of attacking them or something like that. So back to my own, own experience, um, I was facing, um, I was experiencing a lot of anxiety and I hadn't had that before in my life, at least to my knowledge. Um, uh, growing up, I've had separation anxiety, but it's not the same as just anxiety. Um, and I remember the, the moment where I felt it's really bad is when my memory got very, very affected, very heavily affected to the point where uh, for example, I would send something to a friend, like a picture, and then 20 minutes later, I would send the same picture and they would go like, you just sent me this. And um, it would happen within my relationship as well. Uh, I would say something, for example, I remember one day I told my partner, let's watch a movie. And then I just went and had a two hour call with a friend. And when I came back, she was like, why did you do that? And I said, do what she said I got ready to watch a movie and he just went on a two-hour call and I was like I forgot and and th these are just two random examples there are so many like this and and with time I, I was embarrassed and it got to a point where whenever I was going to share something with someone I would start with so I don't know if I've told you this already but uh, because I was so embarrassed of the things that I would keep on telling people over and over again Another thing that went along my um, burnout um, was uh, sleep deprivation. I was not very able to sleep. And, and the sleep deprivation kind of uh, multiplies the memory loss as well. So it goes hand in hand. The, your brain just gets tired and it's not getting enough rest. So it gets more damage and your memory loss can get worse. Um, I think those three things for me um, were very um, existent my burnout and the way I dealt with it was um, I distanced myself from the physical community so the vegans around me uh, completely distanced myself uh, not not because I was upset with them or something but I was not able to take a break I always felt guilty of taking a break um, and I always ended up going with them to an activism event um, so I knew that if I distance myself and I don't, I'm not around any activists or activism event, I'm not going to have the option to end up going because I'm feeling guilty. Uh, so I did that. I did some therapy. Um, meditation helped a lot. I tried to meditate as much as I can. I know I can do more, but I do have a dedication problem with meditation. Uh, working on it. Um, and the thing that helped me most, but unfortunately... I have to say, it doesn't mean that it's going to help everyone. And I, I advocate this a lot with anyone who suffers from um, 
just <laughs> mental difficulties in general are um, ice ice baths. I don't know if you've given it a try, but um, I've seen it, it. Haven't tried it yet. <laughs> yeah. So I I deal very bad with cold. I'm the first year I lived in Europe when I was studying there. I was almost gonna take a flight and go back to Lebanon and never come back to Europe. I was petrified by the cold. And um, so I'm really bad with cold, but I wanted to give it a try just out of curiosity. I had no idea it's gonna affect my mental health. And I started doing it on a daily basis. The first time I sat down in an ice bath, I lasted around six seconds, I think. And I couldn't even walk normally afterwards because my feet were in so much pain. pain. And within, within a week or two, I would say, um, I was able to sit up to three or five minutes. And basically the way it works is you are in a very, very uncomfortable situation. Being in the ice cold water is not comfortable. So your brain is kind of get, getting trained to find comfort and discomfort. And that same way of functioning of finding comfort and discomfort can be replicated in your day-to-day -day life. When something horrible ha happens, you feel uncomfortable, but your brain is getting the training of feeling comfort in general, even within these uncomfortable situations. So I had no idea it's, that's going to happen. For me, it was just like, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try. And within weeks, my sleep got better. My anxiety kind of almost completely went away. So much change happened. But I do want to say, obviously, I don't think this works for everyone. It's what worked for me. Um, I do know that meditation definitely works. I do know that being active works, going on walks, running, just using your body as much as you can works. Um, but for me specifically, this helped a lot. And obviously this distancing myself as much as I can from the um, root cause of the anxiety or whatever it was that was troubling me. Well, thank you. That's such a wonderful insight. And um, yeah, like even I'm, I'm from Wales and I'm used to like, again pretty cold like british cold at the least but yeah. um yeah to me the the idea of it sounds horrible but then um listen to the benefits of it it's like oh maybe maybe we do need to get ourselves a big old tub out there and a, and a bucket yeah, of ice but yeah. um it's this guy is it, is it wim hof that does it i believe yes, wim hof. yeah we, we were watching some of his doing. Ah, and um, a friend of ours who I believe you know as well, Lucy Verde Rose as well. I've seen, I her. yeah, I've seen Lucy. She's she's been doing it a bit lately on her social media, and, and I know she's um she's become a big fan of it. And we're um yeah, we're... she will be in this series as well. Um, and she will be talking about our um well burnout recovery and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's gonna be a good episode. She was so... the one that actually helped us with meditation. So yeah, we're definitely mm. advocates oh, for fine. that as well. Although we're a bit like you, you know, some days we're not as good as we should be, but we try. <laughs> Built. Yeah. yeah but um so um we've touched on what you sort of do now a bit but um so do you have any more of a, a structure now that you keep in place for yourself so that going forward with the advocacy because you're still pumping out these amazing youtube videos you're still really smashing it on the advocacy front do you have a, a bit of a structure to help keep you away from burning out again yeah so um it was thanks to my partner who kind of forced me into having the structure um I used to work every day, at least between six to 10 hours, sometimes 15 or 18 hours. Um, right now I have a very strict schedule of, uh, well, to be honest, last year I told my partner, that's it, I'm, I'm gonna do an effort. Thursdays, I take the day off. Thursdays, I don't work. Um, and it, it didn't really work. <laughs> um, I didn't really respect it very well, but this year, uh, for the past two and a half months, I would say, um, I've been quite strict of taking weekends off and that has been working so well to the, to the point where I'm getting more productive. So um, I just recently prepared a schedule of which days I film a video, upload the video, publish a video, which days I do an Instagram post and everything. And I have a schedule there and I have this like little whiteboard here with everything that I have to do. And um, the way I'm doing things, for example, with YouTube videos is uh, on Mondays, I just try to film two or three videos in one day. I finish a video, I change my t-shirt, I film another video, <laughs> I change my t-shirt, I film another video. Um, but the, pro the difficulty is that you, you run out of ideas sometimes because there's just like, you can't just make videos randomly. You have to have something that interests people, something that you think is 
beneficial to the movement, some reflections that you've had about a certain subject. Um, however, I do have to say that the structure that I've implemented right now with taking weekends off has been working very well. I was close to making exceptions, but I decided not to. Uh, it was for a podcast recently. They asked me for a Saturday, and I said, I'm sorry, I take Saturdays off. Um, and I, 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 was, I thought I'm going to feel guilty, uh, but I felt good. I felt good because it's giving me time to be my own self as well. You know, people forget that like someone who does activism full time is also still a human being who has their own interests, who has their own hobbies, um, who has their own circle of friends, you know, and we have to do those things in order to stay healthy. Otherwise you just burn out. And there are, I do have a very close friend who pushed it so much that he's just not able to do activism at all right now. He's, re he's kind of in a good place mentally, but anything activism related just triggers his burnout. Um, so I, I do promote self-care and the idea that we should remember that we are individuals with our own interests. Like, I don't mind sharing it. I woke up at 5.30 today and at 6.30 a.m. I was surfing in the ocean and then I came back at 7.30 and I was ready to start the day. It's, it's, that's why my hair looks like this. <laughs> but um, it, it, I've, I've been doing this because I grew up with a, with a background of skateboarding. I skated for more than 10 years of my life. And then when I became an activist, I just pushed all my interests aside and I became nothing but an activist. And it's so unhealthy. And, and we have to remember that, you know, like I don't skate here, but surfing is quite similar. And being in nature like that is, is a good push for me to start the day just being in the ocean. Even if it's not a good day to surf, I just go anyway, just to be in the ocean for a bit, recharge, come come back home motivated to start the day at 7.30. Again, like I do wake up very early, which makes it possible for me to still get a lot of work done. Uh, at one point I was waking up at even 4.30, working until 6.30 and then surfing and then working again. But I've pushed it back now um, to working only after surfing. <laughs> and I, I encourage everyone to, pick up their hobbies and remember that they are individuals and they should take care of themselves for the sake of the animals as well, by the way, not only for their sake, because if we, if we are burnt out, we can help the animals. No, that's fantastic advice. Mm. And yeah, can, um, it's what we advocate for here at vegan FTA that we take, uh, take care of ourselves, both mentally and physically, because if we can't help ourselves, we can't help anyone else. Mm. If we, if we're burnt yes. out, if we're, sick and, and dying because we're not looking after ourselves well we're not yeah. going to be able to do it do our best for the animals and yeah it's brilliant advice also the whiteboards thing what the audience can't see outside of the, the <laughs> shot here we've got whiteboards over here we've got whiteboards down there we've got whiteboards there, and i've even got one down there whiteboards for everything because you can write yeah. all your tasks my brain is now all around it me helps. instead <laughs> it really helps a lot it's good uh, definitely yeah i would forget my head if it wasn't stuck on really you know we really need, we need to, i'm a list person it's something so so um you know satisfying about rubbing things off that whiteboard and scheduling days for things so yeah you're so right about that and i'm starting to think that we shouldn't work tomorrow tomorrow is saturday here <laughs> yeah, yeah i encourage you to do that get out in the garden instead i i don't think i would try surfing it's i should be over here we've got some wonderful surf beaches but yeah, yeah. it's not my forte i used to be a skater as well but um the thing is i I blame it on my Welsh blood. Um, it must be full of coal from the, the ancestral mining days because I sink like a stone. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though. I love that point. I'm sure there must be other people that will be watching that be thinking that really resonates. You know, we are regular people as well, and we're not all superhuman that have to just keep going, going yeah. all the time because we can't just do that. And particularly in the last year. Um, I mean, you know, we've we've been extremely lucky over here in New Zealand, but 2020 was a year that still shocked us in so many ways. And, you know, when we think back, there were just so many disasters on different levels. Yeah. Um, you know, us as well, we've, we've been trying to catch up with this chat for a long, long time. And um, not least, you know, because um, 
because of what affected you particularly in with the uh, the port explosion explosion in Beirut on uh, on August the 4th just as you were flying home and we were due to catch up and, and all sorts going on so with Lebanon itself already in financial crisis the event which occurred only made things even harder and no sooner had you arrived you got straight into helping the community and spent two months providing 2,000 families with plant-based meals, which is incredible, uh, as well as helping the Lebanese vegans to find funding to pay for the care and rehabilitation of the injured animals over there. That's fantastic. And I bet you never imagined that you would be doing that, you know, <laughs> at the time when you were just, just oh. flying home, see family. Um, can you tell us a bit about this experience and what it was like to be on the ground during that time? Yeah, of course. So I was... Um... I, I finished packing my bags. Um, I was in touch with my family through the WhatsApp chat group. So we have a family group on WhatsApp. And um, I was asking questions about this online application that I had to fill out for the health uh, ministry in Lebanon, just like some information. And as I'm asking the questions, uh, my brother-in-law uh, uh, replied, Seb, don't come. Just these three words. And he was helping me with the questions before. And he just wrote that out of nowhere. And I was like, why? And then immediately everyone started typing, um, where's where's your brother? Where's your sister? Is everyone okay? And I knew something's happening. And I'm just looking at my phone like, what is going on? And then uh, my sister called me immediately. She said, we don't know what's going on. There was a huge explosion. We, we're looking for your brother. Like, we don't know where he is uh, yet. And then I got the video and I immediately thought, um, it was, it was the Israeli army that bombed the, the port of Beirut um, because previous wars had happened um, usually in summer. I don't know why it's weird. Like summer is wartime. Like if there's going to be trouble in Lebanon, it's summer. Uh, even if it's not like the Israeli army, like other problems, let's say. Um, it has happened one year where I was there during summer and 45 minutes from my place, ISIS entered the borders of Lebanon, it's like every summer there's something. And I was like, but this explosion was something I had never seen before, never. And I was trying to find an explanation of what is going on and no one had an answer. And I'm looking at my luggage and I'm looking at my partner and I'm like, I don't know if you should come because if this is war, I'm gonna go to my family, but I'm not bringing you with me. And there was this tense moment between us. She was like, no, like, I'm not going to let you go alone. And I was like, okay, let's take some time. Maybe some explanations are going to come up. Uh, Israeli army didn't take responsibility. So I was like, okay, so it's not going to be a war, uh, which is good. And then the discussion came up that it, it was a storage of uh, ammonium nitrate, which is a fertilizer, but also a very highly inflammable uh, material. And apparently there was some fire, which... Um, got its way to that um, storage um, building and everything blew up. Still, a lot of people doubt this story. I'm not going to get into that. But my first reaction was, how can I help? You know, I'm flying there tomorrow morning. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And 300,000 people lost their houses um, in just six seconds. Everything was gone. So I knew that people don't have access to their kitchen. And even if they have access to their kitchen, they don't have money to buy food, the most basic thing, because they're gonna use their money to fix their houses. While, by the way, the banks have put a, a law which doesn't allow you to withdraw your money from the bank account because of the financial crisis. They're trying to keep the currency um, value high. So people just didn't know what to do. And I immediately launched a campaign with Lebanese vegans to uh, like a crowdfunding campaign um, to distribute free vegan food, of course, and also to take care of animals, uh, other animals who have been injured. So when I got there the second day, um, we started buying hundreds and hundreds of kilos of bulk food in like huge bags. Um, and there was one um, family, uh, well, one vegan activist, the founder of Lebanese Vegans, his family owned the property that they weren't using. He said, we can use it as our base. So we all gathered there. We started preparing the boxes. We made a leaflet about plant-based diet uh, in Arabic because we are aware that it's not the best timing to talk about animal rights when you're showing up to someone's house who has lost a family member or something. We have to make sure that we do this in an effective way. Um, so we distributed the food. We got support from Million Dollar Vegan, an amazing organization. They sent us support as well to buy more food even. 
And with time, we were thinking, what can we do more than this? Um, and uh, the idea came up of starting an animal rights and being a support center, one of a kind. I, we've been staying in the Middle East, but we're pretty sure in the whole world. <laughs> We just don't want to sound like we're bragging too much by saying in the world, but it is one of a kind. Um, and the, the animal rights center that we have right now is the base that we were using. And it has a cafe where people can come and eat for free. Um, they can leave donations if they wish, but it's fully free. Anyone can come. Um, and we also do documentary screenings, lectures, workshops. Uh, we're going to help um, by doing, uh, let's say, uh, workshops on vegan cooking uh, for like cheap, low budget cooking, because we have to, we have to stop those quinoa, kale, salad, plant-based diets and also do, I mean, not fully stop, of course, some people do want that, but some people don't, can't afford that. And we have to make uh, the diet accessible to everyone. So we want to help people. So that's why it's called an animal rights center, but also a vegan support center. And we're going to be doing campaigns as well. We, uh, we've already started registering Lebanese vegans as an NGO. And we're going to be doing billboards and a lot of things are coming up and we're really excited for it. And all of this was the result of the explosion that happened. It was quite draining. It was difficult to walk in the streets where you've spent so much time and see so much this like destruction everywhere. Um, no one I know got, well, I, I know one person who passed away. I wasn't very close to him, but none of my close family or friends got severely injured in any way. But obviously a lot of people died, a lot of people are still suffering from it. And uh, we, can, we can only hope that with our center now, we can bring more peace and compassion and justice um, in Lebanon. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, yeah, it's yeah, it's incredible the work you guys are doing out there. And yet yeah, for us, we saw the, the footage of the explosion and it was, we oh, were wow. checking our emails, weren't we? Because it was so close to where we were talking. We were like, where's Seb? Is he left? Did he go? Is he in the air? Yeah. Like, is he okay? So, um, and It's, it's really great to know that uh, Million Dollar Vegan also stepped in with that because I, I didn't know about that. No, part. I think brilliant. Um, for any of our audience who want to know more about that, uh, check out season one of Activists because we speak to Matthew Glover, uh, one of the co-founders of that. So um, if you want to learn more about him and his organization, we do have a video on that. Um, but yeah, like, it's fantastic the work that you guys are doing down there. And, you know, after doing such an amazing project like that, you know, what, what's on the cards for SEBS 2021? Are there any other big, uh, big projects or is it mainly yeah. focused on the Lebanese uh, vegans? Um, so I have to publish my ebook. Uh, it took some time because um, I didn't have enough funds to get official translation for every single language, but I had an amazing team of volunteers and the ebook is going to be, available in 18 languages in total, uh, fully free for anyone to download and learn from. It's called Logical Fallacies and Animal Rights. Uh, uh, actually, no, it's, it's about logical fallacies and animal rights, but it's called When Animal Rights Meets Logical Fallacies, um, or the other way around, When Logical Fallacies Meet the yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I've been, I've been doing the uh, reformatting of so many languages and some of them I can read, so I'm just being, I've just been confusing it. But it doesn't matter what the title is, the content is more important. It's, it's about how we relate to other animals by using logical fallacies. And I think this is a much stronger base for activists to use uh, rather than arguing with facts, because facts, you know, you can mention a study that you know is a fact, and sometimes it's really weird. There is another study that is peer reviewed, it's not fake or industry funded that shows the opposite of what you're sharing. So you can end up arguing with people back and forth, but most of the time, our relation to other animals, and when I say our, I mean society, is based on logical fallacies. And if we can just point out people's logical fallacies, they cannot continue the argument because it's not like, if you lack logic in your argument, then you have to come up with a new argument. And this is something that vegans do as well. So in the, in the ebook, I also talk about logical fallacies vegans use. So for each logical fallacy, I give the non-vegan version and the vegan version, just to give a very random example. Uh, for example, if someone says other animals eat animals, therefore we can eat animals and it's moral uh, because it happens in nature. So that's an appeal to nature. Uh, if you appeal to nature in order to justify what you're doing, that's a logical fallacy. This is how non-vegans use it. Vegans on the other side say 80% of animals out there are herbivores, therefore we should be herbivores. Again, another appeal to nature. That is not a strong argument 
uh, for animal rights. So uh, the ebook um, is all about different lo logical fallacies and it's very simply explained. Um, it gives examples and everything and it's gonna be for free. I'm just finishing the formatting right now because I have 18 languages that were sent to me in different formats and different, everything is different. Um, so once that is ready, I will be publishing it on my website for free to download by anyone who wishes to learn about it. Another project that I would love to continue is the university and school lectures that I had started last year in March. I was supposed to do around 50, but I managed to do only 11 because the pandemic started. Um, another project is going to be Lebanese vegans and working on campaigns. I do want to put more effort on that than um, individual activism efforts because I do believe that I'm leaning more towards community activism than individual, let's say, one-man show. I can still do my lectures and everything, and it helps to put the message out there, but I find so much value in community activism, and um, it's really great to have a team like the team that we have that with Lebanese vegans, um, and the way like we all work together is really healthy, so really looking forward to that. Well, I can't wait for that, and um, yeah. on Vegan FT, I'm sure that we'll be uh, sharing it when it's out, um, mm -hmm. the book for you, so people can get their, uh, their hands on it too, because Oh, it sounds wonderful. It sounds an amazing book. It's so much needed as well, definitely. But um, although in this uh, this talk, you know, we've touched on several topics which um, you cover in your YouTube channel, I will once again encourage our viewers, mm -hmm. uh, follow the link we'll provide in the description, check out Seb's wonderful in-depth videos on these topics because they're just fantastic. You can sit on it all day and just, yeah, there's just... I've, I've got to say, for this series, I have to watch a lot of videos. I have to listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, and Seb, you've done fantastic with it because I was really... I enjoy a lot of the stuff that I, I listen to and watch, but um, your stuff, I just like, ooh, it, it, where's the next one, the next one, the next yeah, one? So, so insightful. <laughs> I, I think our, our favourite podcast that, that um, you did as well was with it's Simon Miller. Um, yes. It's Australian Simon guy. Simon Hill. Why do I always want to call him the wrong name? I'm sorry, Simon Hill. Uh, um, you have a fantastic podcast. podcast. Is it Plant Proof Podcast? Plant Proof, yes. At least I got that right. That, that's a really fantastic podcast that, you know, um, you, you cover a lot of great topics in as well. So, um, you know. Would, I really enjoyed doing that. That was an awesome one. Yeah, definitely. Are there any other places that um, you would like our audience to know about so that they can go and support your work? So, um, People can, if they would like to support my individual activism, they can check out my website, sebalex.org. I have all the support information there. Um, they can also check out ethicsoverhabits.com. I make um, organic fair trade and um, vegan, of course, merchandise um, and zero, zero waste products. Um, and all of the profit, obviously, I use it for my activism projects. Uh, I mean, I say all of the profit. It's a small it's a small website. It's not like you're going to land some, something like Amazon. Um, but um, yeah, I make everything here in Indonesia locally with small family owned businesses, um, not big factories or anything, mostly women owned businesses to encourage that as well. And also if they would like to support the Animal Rights Center in Lebanon, I do have the um, uh, website the, or the fundraising website of the Animal Rights Center on my Instagram bio um, and they can check it out there and support the Animal Rights Center if they wish. Thank you for watching this episode. If you'd like to support our speaker then follow the links provided in the description. If you're enjoying this content then please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Leave a like on our videos or drop a comment with something that you've learned. Your love and support means the world to us and we thank you all for watching this.